biters this is diane hello and welcome to the walking dead edition there's the adhd the anxiety the ptsd the depression the crushing loneliness and the active imagination that helps me cope with all of that maybe the only sane response in an insane world and you know i've never hallucinated before but there's a first time for everything this is murdell <laughs> It might not be. <laughs> it might be Ezekiel. It might be Eugene. Eugene. Yeah. We that think Yumiko was actually present in the beginning. What was that? That horrible voiceover in the beginning. Oh my god. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> this was probably not one of my favorite episodes. All right, welcome to Biters, everybody. <laughs> we are doing season 10, and I'm not doing that C crap. We're doing 10, 20, Splinter. So it, I think it's like C4. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Okay, so what is your rating? I think it's your turn this time. Sure, sure. Uh, my rating, and I am really surprised. I know that it is just aired, so there's not a lot of um, ratings on IMDb yet. But so far, it's really low on IMDb. Yeah, and we seem to be completely out of sync this 10C season with everybody for the ones that we like. Like, Oh, my God. Remind me that I have feedback from Thomas and Shenandoah, by the way, speaking of out of sync. Go ahead. Okay. So I rated it a pretty solid 4.1 zombie conductors. Um, I liked it. I It improved upon rewatch. Uh -huh. And then I went back and rewatched a couple of scenes um, because it had that whole element of what was real. So when I first watched it, I watched it in the bath. I wasn't really paying close attention um like for instance when um she had the story about when her mother said don't eat i was I, like <sighs> i was not paying close enough attention so i was like oh my god her mother like basically gave her bulimia or something you know like yeah I, no. that's when i got out yeah. of it the first time and then when i rewatched it i was like oh my god it's even worse and so again i went back and watched some parts for a third time so i, I it, it just it kept improving upon rewatch and the whole element of what was real and what was not, I loved. So 4.1 zombie conductors. Okay. That was our mother calling, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like she knows we're in the middle of a podcast. She totally knows we're podcasting. I will give you my rating and then I'll send her a message on Facebook because you know she's going to be psycho. <laughs> I'm taking her to an appointment tomorrow. So I'm sure she's calling saying, are you still psyching me? Okay, I rated it probably higher than I would have only because it's The Walking Dead. Because I didn't particularly like this episode. I was probably closer to the rating on IMDb. Okay. But I rated it higher than that. I said 3.71 apocalypse years like dog years out of five. <laughs> Because remember, True. she said it's like 150 yeah. years in, in apocalypse years. Yeah, yeah. If you've known somebody for a week, that's like a lifetime. <laughs> you are not kidding. Yeah. And, you know, I one of the things that I really liked, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about more about it, but one of the things that I really, really liked about this episode is this episode was made, like, post, it was being shot post, like, pandemic. Like, they were still in the middle of it. They were still in the middle of it. But it was so far into to COVID that, you know, these are the reoccurring thoughts and feelings that we are all having. We are all, you know, lonely and going a little stir crazy. And, you know, so I, I just... I I, th I think I, I identify, I think maybe like a year ago, I wouldn't have liked this episode that much, but because it, it was about, you know, loneliness and isolation and, and things like that, those, those overlapping themes with what is going on in the real world, I really liked it. Huh. So hmm. everybody else is wrong. I'm right. You're right. I'm wrong. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> Oh. All right. So the numbers continue to get worse. Mm, yeah. Um, it was 2.17 million views for one more, which was last week's episode. So it'll be interesting to see what the views are for this week's episode. 
the rating, as we talked about on IMDb, was 5.3 out of 10. Mm-hmm. Which is really low. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Last episode got like an 8 or something, didn't it? Yeah, last episode was an 8. So, yeah, um, it's just crazy to me. And like I said, I know it's early. It's only got a thousand reviews right now for Splinter. So that rating could go up, but. I don't think it's going to. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting. And it'll be interesting to see how it is, you know. Yeah. Only time will tell. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I as I looked at the, the numbers for this week, and I actually have made a new friend recently who is, is pretty into comic books and pretty into sci-fi kind of stuff, and we were talking about Walking Dead, and he said, I haven't watched The Walking Dead in years. And I hear people say that to me a lot when I say that you and I podcast about The Walking Dead. I would say more often than not, more often than not, the response that I get these days is, oh, I haven't watched The Walking Dead in forever. And now you're like, we can't be friends. Now. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's not the case. <laughs> um, but, you know, what's really funny is um, the other thing that I hear in addition to I haven't watched The Walking Dead in forever is, oh, I fell off when Glenn and Abraham were killed. You know, we were just talking about that. And I was saying that I don't think as many people fell off because of that but like they also went to the amc streaming stuff that no nah, you know you and i have talked about that a yeah. lot but i actually really think that a lot of people did legit fall off when glenn yeah. and abraham were killed i fully admit i could be wrong about that because i would say i get that as much as i get oh yeah i haven't watched that in years yeah hmm all right, so the title, you know, the immediate immediate thing that's obvious, it, it's called Splinter. And, of course, Princess is Splinter and her story about getting a splinter when she was a kid. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that I thought, and this is somewhat similar to what Angela Kang said in the, mm-hmm. the post-credits things, was, you know, it's because the group is splintered now. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was... You're getting there. A splinter is something that ranges from being really irritating to incredibly painful. Okay. So where does this fall on the the spectrum and what exactly does does this mean? I'm not getting to where you wanted me to get. So what are you thinking? So um, she gets this splinter and... She's talking to Yumiko and she, the story, Yumiko's like, keep talking to me. And so she goes about telling the story of how it reminds her of the, when she got a splinter after being locked in a closet and she goes, you know, through this whole story about her hand got infected and her stepfather thought it was gross and like made her not eat at the table and her mom didn't stick up for her, said, you know, then don't eat. And um, basically kind of like this abuse situation and then her mom taking her stepfather's side. And she's talked about in the episode how she's been hit multiple times in that same part of her jaw Mm -hmm. and the fracture always heals just fine. So Princess has been very physically and emotionally abused. And um, when that tends to happen um, at a young age, people's personalities oh i'm so glad you said that that was in my writing potpourri yeah yeah so um i think that we saw her personality splinter uh and do you want to talk more about now or in writing no go ahead i mean i didn't have anything other than i i think this also is part of the name yeah and so I I went back um, and she even said to um, because though there's that whole surrounding element of we don't know what's real and what's not. And in Talking Dead, they kind of went through what was real and what wasn't. I kind of wish they hadn't done that. I kind of wish they would have left it up up to us to, you know, mull it over and argue about on the Internet. Um, (laughs) But so um, 
the interrogation was real. And one of the things that she did tell the guy who was searching her for bites, which is really invasive, by the way, um, was she's like, hey, could you help me out with this splinter? It's driving me crazy. Oh. And so, like, there's already that element of, like... And they said on The Talking Dead, they had that little behind the scenes, you know, info. And that one of my opening line is, um, I don't know if you guys are, I think you guys are real. I've never hallucinated before, but there's a first time for everything. So she's, she's talked about like, you know, this voices in her head and everything. And three very distinct characters came out in her head. She had Ezekiel, who was her protector. And anyone who has faced trauma or abuse that has any sort of fantastical character in their mind or a stuffed animal or something that protects them. They have a protector. You know, that's the the thing that's going to the thing or the person that's going to get in front of you and is not going to let your abuser hurt you anymore. And that's exactly what he said. And then what happens to abuse or trauma victims was they this they tend to have a need to help others who are in their situ worse off in their situation. And that was Yumiko. She was trying to help Yumiko to keep her own mind off of the trauma that was happening to her right then, which was her claustrophobia and um you know, the the violence that had just happened to her. Um, you know, we, we see see her pacing the the car, counting her steps, and she's going through the um, state capitals in alphabetical order as a coping mechanism. Well, then she gets to talk to Yumiko, and Yumiko has a head injury, and she's trying to keep her awake, and she's trying to, you know, calm her down and get her help and all these things. And so the the focus of the abuse victim they can they can focus their energy someplace else instead of on themselves and that's also a coping mechanism and then eugene was our voice of reason eugene was oh. yeah so you see all of these elements of people who have been through um and it usually starts young um, all of these elements of uh, people who have survived traumatic or abusive situations ha tend to have these characteristics, you know, somewhere in them, or even they have how somehow have them extra extrovertedly too. Like you could have a physical manifestation. You could have a best friend who is like, I'm your ride or die best friend. If anybody like messes with you, I'll turn them into a skin suit, you know, <laughs> dude, you are my ride or die. <laughs> I am. I will make if anybody hurts you, I will make a skin suit. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to say what you actually said. <laughs> I, I have recently threatened to turn somebody's scrotum into a keychain. So, uh, <laughs> and he was very intimidated that I could find his date of birth and his mom's name on the internet. So because you're a crazy psycho yeah. stalker. Yeah, don't don't mess with a, a chick's ride or die chick or we are better at the FBI than researching you on the internet. 100 100 so, percent you know and so you know she's she's got her her enforcer she's got her wounded bird and then she's got the voice of reason in eugene who's like no 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 just, just write it out everything's gonna be okay do what they say follow their orders you know so you have all three of those elements that would be battling it out in her head but she, conveniently she has three characters with her that she is manifesting uh in themselves and that's i mean i loved it because it was such a confusing episode because you know and they talked about it on talking dead where ezekiel's like this is not me you know <laughs> and uh, the audience is right there along with them where it's like this this really this isn't ezekiel this is like is this tumor like pressing on like something bad like what's going on but yeah so that was uh, that was her splinter. Her her personality splintered off. And what's funny is towards the end of the episode when she is uncuffing the trooper and the splinter comes out, that seems to be kind of the end of that. 
it was almost like the splinter actually drove her crazy. Like she said in the beginning, it's driving me crazy. And as soon as the splinter came out, it was like, okay, you know, I've answered your questions. I've uncuffed you. Like, can I see my friends? You know? So, yeah. (sighs) There was a lot in that title. There was a lot in that title. And I am going to tell you that, um, yeah, there was a little bit about this episode that I really liked. And there was some stuff about this episode that I did not like. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, just very quick, because we've talked about all of these people before, although I didn't remember recently having talked about one of them. So the writers were Vivian Say, who was on Talking Dead, and Julia Rookman. I hope I said her name properly. Um, I remembered talking about Vivian Say quite a bit because she has a distinctive name, and I, and I always struggle making sure that I'm pronouncing it properly. So she wrote Morningstar, and it actually turns out that she wrote Morningstar with Julia Rookman. She also wrote Stradivarius, which always makes me think of Luke, who we have not seen Mm -hmm. enough in this after season. Um, Julia Rookman has written this, The Tower, Morningstar, as we said, and The World Before. And I remember The Tower. I don't remember The World Before. Um, She also wrote For the Sun, which was a Pierce Brosnan property on AMC, And then she wrote for some things that I don't recognize. American Odyssey, Covert Affairs, The Troop, The Assistants. And, I, you know, I was thinking as I was writing all that stuff, rattling all that stuff off earlier today while I was doing prep, I thought, you know, I'm probably just rattling off someone's favorite show. And they're like, hello, that's a great show. (laughs) I didn't recognize any of them except this and The Sun. Um, the world before was, uh, Oh no, no. I mean, in terms of other stuff that she's written other than oh, walking okay. dead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't either. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard of covert affairs, but not really my jam. So, I mean, let's face it. Most TV is my jam. I just haven't gotten to it. Yeah. There's so much more. I mean, now I have to watch WandaVision. I have to watch uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. There's so much more. Yeah, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, And I actually, I never really got into the new Superman movies or the new Batman movies. And I I actually just started um, onto those. And... (sighs) We Diane and I are trying to prep for the four hour Snyder cut of the Justice League so that we can be on um, Capes and Lunatics uh, next weekend. Is it next weekend? It's next weekend. Yes. That was going to be in my housewife's uh, housekeeping. Four hours, man. And it's getting such mixed reviews from our geek friends. Yeah, I would say it's getting mostly negative reviews. It's getting neg- like the hardcore, the more hardcore the fan is, the more negative the reviews. So I'm like, hmm, that means I'll probably like it because I'm not a hardcore, hardcore fan. I'm probably not going to like it because I'm not a hardcore fan. You're probably not going to like it because it's four freaking hours long. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, God, that's like four hours of my life I'm not going to get back. Yeah, that that's I'm going to have to really pay attention to those four hours because I am not rewatching that. Yeah. Mm. God. Ugh. I'm not looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, director. So, same director as last week, so I'm not going to say much about her other than her name, Laura Belsey. And if you haven't listened to Biter's last last week episode, you should. So, there we are. So, you watched The Talking Dead this week, right? I did. Did you you watch last week's? I did not. And Phil said it was, like, really great this week. And I was like, nah, it's not so great. I love Ron Funches. Like... I, I'm I, not in love with him. I love him. He's just so funny. 
Like, it, just his his answers for stuff, like, they were talking about the two walkers that were in this episode, and they were like, what walkers would you have given uh, Paola uh, for her scene? And he's like, it would have been a cop walker, a construction worker walker, and a Native American walker. And he's like, I'd have had the village people in there. Number one <laughs> post-apocalyptic album. And I'm like, oh my god, that is hilarious. <laughs> See, I was only half watching it, so I caught the like post apocalyptic post apocalyptic album, but I didn't catch the whole Yeah, so shame on me for not watching it closer. I was kinda yeah. trying to prep and watch and like nap and do all three of those things at the same time because my life is crazy. And um <laughs> and I didn't accomplish any of them very well. Ugh. Well, here and I tried to do something new and podcast actually in my home office. It just didn't work out that way. No, we ended up chatting for like an hour and 10 minutes before we actually started recording because of life changes, updates, and then the Skype connection was rotten on the other computer. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, featured cast. You chose him, and it's and we didn't do any of the main cast because we've talked about all of them, and so we're basically podcasting on the guy who played Commonwealth Interrogator. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna let you re 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 pronounce his oh, last name for I'm me. I'm not sure that I'm saying it right, but it's Jesse James Lecarrier. That sounds good to me. I'm I'm risking it. That's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> um there's really not that much out there about him no there wasn't a ton um he's been in actually quite a bit uh a lot of one-offs that's that what i, I wrote seen. down to <laughs> yeah um so revolution we actually just talked about that one last week um revolution turn yeah. Well, he's, yeah, he's in turn, but he's oh. also in Revolution. Oh, I missed that completely. What was Revolution? And how did we talk about it? How um, lame so we were am talking I? talking about um, Jericho and how... Oh, okay. And Lenny was... James was in Jericho. Yeah. Yeah. And like they have the same... They had a, also a crossover character or they had like a, a same actor or something um, or writer or something like that. And uh, they're, they're very similar and both of them are very, very good. I loved Revolution. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Haven't watched it, but it oh the advertisements always look good for Devious Maids. Uh, <laughs> I've never uh, heard of. I literally have never heard of it, so I didn't write it down. Oh, it's it's. You know, I want to say it's Tyler Perry uh, on one of the. Um, what network is it on? I cannot remember. Uh, anyway, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of like, you know, maids who work in upper class people and they're, you know, they're hot. So they're, they're sleeping with the sons of the mansion owners and they're, you know, not nice girls sometimes. Um, so he was in an episode of Under the Dome, a Stephen King property. Yes, uh, I, I noticed that. Uh huh. The Originals, which is a spinoff of The Vampire Diaries. I have not watched it. He was an Ant Man. Yeah. He, so I had to laugh. I was like, okay, he played Alpha Guard in Ant Man. He played <laughs> Interrogator in Under the Dome. And he played Border Guard in Homeland. And I was like, hmm, he's kind of got a type. Right. And then I thought, you know, this stuff pays the bills. It looks like he likes some stage acting. This stuff pays the bills. Um, he was in Sleepy Hollow, and I know we've had some character, some, some actor crossover mm -hmm. from there. Um, he was in Ozark, and did we decide Ozark was a Stephen King or not? It's not a Stephen King. Now I'm going to have to okay. look it up. I, I think I always confuse it with, uh, The Outsider, because it kind of has the same feel. Oh, really? Yeah. And they both had Jason Bateman in them. Ozark, a financial family drags his, uh, a financial advisor drags his family from Chicago to the Missouri Ozarks. It's a good show. Where he must launder money in order to appeal a, appease a drug boss. Yep. 
it's a good show. If like, and one of the people who was on Talking Dead said, you know, if they had to put. I don't remember if they had to like recast Paola. this. Yeah. Pa- okay, if they had to put Paolo Lazara, Paolo Paolo Lazaro in a role, what what would they put her in? One of them said Ozark. Yep. She would be crazy funny in Ozark. I love her. I still think she's amazing. Yeah. She I was do too. definitely the best part of this episode. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was the primary focus, but yeah. Yeah. Anything um, out about Jesse? Anything else about Jesse James? Um, so there was one really weird tidbit that I came across. Oh, I wonder if it's him. the same one that I came across. Go ahead. Um, so he used to be a set decorator slash de- dresser. Oh, no, I have something um, different. So go ahead. Uh, for the RuPa- RuPaul drag show. No and way. Viva Variety. Yep. Cool. Yeah. That so would be you- a better thing that paid the bills. Yeah, that would be funner. Yeah. Than being the border guard in Homeland. Could you imagine um, being backstage at the RuPaul Drag Race? That would be really fun. Okay, so the little tidbit that I found out about him is that his dad is the lead singer of the 70s band Dr. Hook. What? Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> That's funny. And his dad is apparently still touring and singing. Good for him. Yeah. I'm surprised he hasn't made it to the Alaska State Fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the reasons why I picked uh, Jesse James is uh, because I kind of have a feeling either between him or the trooper that got the questioning done i think we're gonna see more of these two so i don't think it's gonna be a one and done episode and the way that jesse talks on his twitter um it kind of sounds that way um there was a couple of really funny posts about um there was one that was kind of political basically People like something to the effect of like people who stormed to the Capitol knew more about like the ins and outs of the Capitol than I than I have. I do of this uh, show that I have been shooting since December. (laughs) And I'm assuming that's the talking or walking dead. I, you know, I hope for his sake that that's the case. I know we're going to see the guy who comes in as Mercer, who is a named guard from the Commonwealth. But, you know, I hope that we see more of this guy. I hope the other guy gets more time. I mean, everybody deserves good incomes and and good runs and hopefully something bigger that grows out of this. Yeah. So he's got a TV movie coming up called The Basement. Um, And he's got one thing in post-production called Roll With It. And one thing in filming status called Chest. Um, The Basement. A group of friends wants to come up with the next million dollar idea fueled by their shared hatred for real jobs and love of instant gratification. Oh my God, don't we all feel that way? Right. (laughs) These wannabes entrepreneurs try to reinvent the basement into their money making machine. Interesting. Hmm. Well, anything else about Jesse James? Um, he is a lefty on Twitter. Ah, so, so don't hate on him, but follow him if you want to. Yep, he is at the J Loco, which is probably a very good thing because your last name is a little hard to pronounce, and you do not say it quite enough during your Facebook lives. So <laughs> just to remember that. Um, but yeah, uh, that's where I found him is on Twitter and Facebook and, um, he's not really active on either of them except for, it looks like he kind of does live streams a lot. Um, he was just on a radio show two days. He did a live on a radio show. So I didn't sit and watch through all of that, but, um, Yeah, I didn't see an Instagram for him, so that's all I got for him. 
That's quite a bit for somebody who is Commonwealth interrogator. <laughs> right? Not even a named. There was even less about Trooper, which was the, the other guy. His... Yeah, the kid who got his face beat. There yeah. were three. There were three Commonwealth yes. guys. It was interrogator, inspector, which is the one who was like leering at her naked body. For oh, far we'll too talk long. about that. And then there was. Uh, um, just trooper. So <sighs> that's all I got. All right. I don't have tons in Whisperer's Corner, but there apparently is a Walking Dead inspired cooking show coming out on AMC and the Complex Networks, which I've never heard of. And it's going to feature Walking Dead talent and Complex Network chefs. Hmm. I know, right? Kind of weird. I'm not sure. I'm. I can. I get ride. I totally understand ride. I'm not sure that I'm down with the whole cooking show thing. So, in our becoming an outdoors woman thing that's held every year, where women can go out. It's it's fishing game sponsored. Women can go out and they go to our quote unquote local Bible camp. Um, that's rented out for a three day weekend and you can learn all kinds of skills, some survival skills, like, you know, shotgunning, you know, it teaches you obviously how to shotgun, but take care of a shotgun and, you know, um, things like that. Uh, there's like basically nature walks you take that look for signs of different signs of animals. Um, Cause a lot of people are looking down for tracks, but bears like to scratch the um, sides of trees. So, you know, don't just be looking down. Um, and one of them is like Dutch oven cooking. You know, you have a, a cast iron Dutch oven that you put over a fire and, you know, and what's funny is they usually get the fish from the fishing class that went out or the crabbing class that went out or um, if they have a good um, animal that a uh, fresh animal, because most of the animals that we uh, like that I worked on to learn how to field dress animals were, had been stored for like six months in a freezer because they were either poached or they were hit by a car or they were, they had to be, uh, taken out humanely because they had become garbage bears or nuisance bears or things like that. So um, if the meat's good, they can be cooked. If not, you know, but they do do cooking classes that are like, you know, you can add, you know, spruce tips to your, you know, meat and it helps break it down and make it more tender. And maybe it'll be like that. Maybe it'll be like, you know, super apocalyptic back road country cooking. I just had this mental image of herring eggs cooked on spruce tips, and I remember eating them many years ago, and they were nasty, so ugh, not a thing. Mm. Yes, no, they that is an apparently acquired taste. They are super salty. I mean, of course, herring eggs. I did um, not acquire it. Mine, it was texture. It was like, you know, you know what Orbeez are? No. They're, they're the um, pretty little, like, gelatinous orbs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You have them in, like, not Flowers smoothies, and, but, like, yeah. yeah. Um, they were basically tiny, tiny little orbs that, like, were, like, instead of popping in your mouth, like, you had to crunch them. They yes. were so tiny. Like, it just it's yes. a, it has a horrible texture. Like, the saltiness <laughs> I can handle. <laughs> Yeah, know. they're gross. Kind of... I remember <laughs> eating them in high school, and they're gross. TMI. If it's salty and in my mouth, I don't want to be chewing on it. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> I have had a Benadryl, a sleeping pill, and a seatbelt. Oh, my God. So... And then I kept you talking for an hour. Oh, dear yeah, God. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, all right. Um... In much sadder and more serious news, so, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how I feel about this, the, an appeals court in Georgia overturned the $8 million verdict that was given to the family for stunt, stuntman John Berniker's death. Mm. 
You know, I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel like if AMC was even, or I don't know that it was AMC, it was some other property that's kind of related to AMC. Yeah. If they were even remotely responsible for this guy's death, they've certainly got the money to pony up. Yeah. Agreed. You know, so it makes me super sad. The attorney for the family said that he's going to take it to the Georgia Supreme Court, so it's not over. There's there's still a chance that the family could get the award. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not sure. Not sure what to think. Um, quick stuff from the Forbes guys. So Eric Kane wrote about this episode, and he made the point that you made, which is that uh we see splinters within Princess herself. Mm-hmm. He didn't make it nearly as articulately as you made it. <laughs> but um but he talks about that, and I thought that was a nice point of his essay. He also says that he was surprised that Princess was the focus of this episode, but he really loves her. So he thought that it was a good choice, even though it was surprising to him. Yeah. Um, and then very quickly, Paul Tassi wrote an article about Stephen Yun's uh, Oscar nominations. So for people who don't know, we're kind of late to the party because we should have mentioned it last week. Stephen Yun was nominated for an Oscar for his role in the movie Minari. Which I looked it up. I haven't watched it yet. It's apparently about a Korean family that starts a farm in Kansas in the 1980s. So I'm guessing it's probably rife with racial conflict. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of a hotbed issue right now in our uh, country. Right? Ugh. Ugh. I actually have a Real Housewives recommendation of something we should podcast about. Oh, good. Okay, I've got a couple of recommendations too, but nothing that that pertinent to current times, so we may have to do that first. Okay. Okay. Um, but anyway, he so Paul Tassie basically says that he feels like The Walking Dead killing off Glenn was a really bad choice from the standpoint of he's a really great actor, and he was also a great... Asian American actor in an Asian American lead in a very prominent mixed on screen relationship. Mm, I can see that. I mean, they were staying true to the books, and this show, one of the things is it's like no one is safe, you know? No one is safe, and then there are also people who are safe now that should not be. His point is, you know, they went off book and killed Abraham, and then they just were gratuitous and added in Glenn. Yeah, I could see that. So, and then didn't even put Maggie with a guy that she was supposed to be in with in the books. Yeah, I don't get the feeling Maggie's with anybody. Really? Yeah, I don't get the feeling she's with anybody. You think she's with that that drink of water that's that's with her that is kind of named but not really didn't wasn't yeah. like yeah. Hmm. Okay, that'll be interesting. We'll have mm-hmm. to we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah. If it plays out at all, the only two episodes we have left look like they are Daryl and Carol centric episodes. Oh, are they yet both again? Dar- are they both Daryl and Carol centric? And then here's Negan. Ah, that's right. Okay, next mm-hmm. week is Daryl and Carol centric. By the way, did you thing. see the preview? <laughs> yes. So, spoiler alert, Dog goes off with Carol. Yeah. Apparently yeah. man's best friend is not man's best friend. <laughs> right? Oh. I you know, I'm I'm already annoyed at that episode and I've only <laughs> seen the advertisement for well, it. So here's the thing, and Steve and Diana have talked about it. I think we haven't talked about it quite so much, but, I mean, they've got built-in plot armor. We know yeah. that Daryl and Carol are going yep. to have an, a, a series together. Yep. So they can make all they want about them having their little tiff and having divergent paths. It's called divergent. Um, but mm, it doesn't mean as much when we know that they're going to go off and have a, a series together exactly that series should not have been announced that series should have been kept under wraps or if they really had to say that they were coming out with a series they should have said they were coming out with a daryl spinoff not a daryl carol spinoff just a daryl spinoff and we'd have been like oh okay you know agreed no. yeah yep. no totally agreed they should have announced the anthology they should have should not have announced the daryl and carol series mm-hmm 
So I don't have anything else in Whisperer's Corner. Um, you've already mentioned that we are going to be on Capes and Lunatics talking about the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. God help me. Um, <laughs> the only other thing that I have is that I think we're going to be recording for Real Housewives tomorrow, and we're going to do the Britney Spears documentary, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to watch that still. Netflix, right? Um, it is actually on Hulu. And um, it's a little difficult to become to find because it's not like its own standalone documentary. It is part of a New York Times. Uh, they they do a different episode every week or whatever. Okay, so for um, those of us who are ridiculous and not as media savvy as you are, how do we find it on Hulu? Um, honestly, I think what I did was I went because it's called Framing Britney Spears. Okay. I think I just went into the Hulu app and searched for Britney Spears. Oh, okay. Well, that's not terrible then. That's and actually make relatively... Sure to... <laughs> if you spell her name correctly. Cause right. There, there are many different spellings of the name Britney. Apparently, I don't know any of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Anything else for Housewives Housekeeping? Mm, I don't think so. I uh, I don't think I have anything either. Uh, so I guess that gets us to our goods, bads, and uglies, and I made you go first. So, so me first. Um. So, and actually, I've kind of already been through my good. Um, it was the whole storyline that Ezekiel was her protector, Yumiko was the one who needed she needed to protect and, Uni, and Eugene was her voice of reason. Um, and you know, I, I think in one of the, the I don't know if it was um, Angela King after the show or if it was on Talking Dead, but one of them said that Ezekiel was kind of like the, the devil sitting on her shoulder, you know, telling her, come on, let's go, let's just leave, you know, and I'm like, no, that's her protector. I don't think that's a devil on her shoulder. I don't think I knew there was a devil or angel battling it out on her shoulder. That's her protector. That's um, he even said um, she's like, I'd be just like mom if I left. And he's like, yeah, but your mom was strong or that may be backwards. They may have. But like they were talking about her mom and, you know, he just he's he's like, you know, you're you're great on your own. And she's like, I'm a superhero. Mm -hmm. you I know? thought that was and a great so line. She, she's the, or she, Ezekiel was the protector and the hype man. And it even like, you should have got a little bit of a glimpse of it from the way that he dropped down from the top of that, um, mm -hmm. from the top of the train car. Uh, yeah. Even he said on talking dead when he was like, yeah, I went full predator with the dreads, you know, mm -hmm. like, it, so I, I just really, really liked how they did that. And, I want to know if one of the women has like some sort of background in psychology or if one of them was a victim of trauma or abuse. That, oh, one of the writers. Yeah, because they did it so well that it was hard to distinguish reality from not reality. And it was spot on with how people with um, abusive or traumatic backgrounds react to new abusive traumatic situations you know they have a tendency to run back to those roles um they you know you go to your happy place and you try to just deal with what is going on now and the best way you have and for uh princess this was you know basically kind of having her personalities take over because she couldn't deal so i really really loved that about the episode because it was just I don't know you know every once in a while the the show will hit a a hot button for me for um my uh misspent youth and you know it's like the, I keep going back to the Eugene episode where I harped on Eugene about being in the friend zone and how there's no such thing as the friend zone. And I harped on that because, you know, every once in a while the show just pushes one of my buttons. Mm -hmm. And this one pushed a, pushed a good button, you know. 
and that you recognize that in somebody else. Interesting. So, so I just want to say really quickly about Ezekiel. Ezekiel, I didn't think of it so much as an angel and devil on her shoulder, but when he was talking to her after kind of showing up leaning on the walkers. I love that. Yeah. I was like, he sounds like the voice of her stepfather. Think so? When he was like, your mother was strong. Yeah. I just, that was kind of the, the note that that struck for me. Yeah. But that was the, come on, let's just go. You can take care of yourself right. better on your own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your good? So my good was actually the plot twist of this being all in her head. I I will be honest and say I didn't see it. When Ezekiel dropped out of the ceiling, I was like, well, he looks pretty good for somebody who's dying of thyroid cancer. I thought so, too. But I didn't see that it was in her head. And I, I didn't realize it until we saw Ezekiel show up leaning up against those walkers. And I was like, what? And then really? I was like, oh, this is like ghosts. This is very much like ghosts. So I... There was a few little things that I caught beforehand that um, this could all, all like all be in her head, um, and uh, it was when he attacked the trooper in the train car. Mm -hmm. He, how did the trooper get in there without him seeing Ezekiel? Oh, I completely missed that. And then, like, at the angle that he attacked Ezekiel, I'm like, there's no way he did not see that coming. And then when he's, like, uh, hidden on the, the trooper, he's he said, uh, no one is going to ever hurt us again like that. And, or hurt me again like that. It's, he said something to the effect where I was like, I... I kind of want to think that that's princess. And there was just a couple of other, their, their little conversations, um, even before they attacked the trooper, when he was talking about, he said something about, you know, um, people act like they love you. And she's like, people suck. And he's like, people act like they love you. But, and she said like, then they're assholes or something like that. She like, so the, the back and forth, I was like, I guess he could be talking about Carol, but I kind of have a feeling that this is a two-sided conversation that one person is having with themselves. Like, Well done. I mean, I, I tend to not watch as critically as I should, and I kind of get led along. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great plot twist. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was still, I was like, okay, so I... After that, I was like, I don't think the Yumiko stuff happened. And then I'm like, I think the Eugene stuff happened, but maybe not. So and I then, felt like the Yumiko stuff happened and I wasn't sure that anything else happened. Um, the Eugene one just seemed like the only one where it like that's Eugene, you know, mm -hmm. um, more concerned about meeting his lady love uh but you know they confirmed it on talking dead that like basically that beginning and then the opening at the train car at the end was real uh oh and i think the interrogation was real um but basically anytime uh princess was on her own none of that was real that was all in her uh, all in her head Hmm. Yeah. It, I, it's so, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I really liked this episode is it, it's so open to interpretation and it really, really makes you think. Yeah. Again, there was stuff that I liked about this episode. There was not stuff that I loved about this episode. Yeah. So my bad for the episode um, and it was nothing bad about the episode. Um, it was, uh, princess's story talking to Yumiko about the splinter 
and getting the infection and having her mom stand up for her stepdad instead of her. And uh, I, I just, her, her home life just made, it made me so sad, you know, she's obviously been through a lot. And then it kind of sounded like later on that there was more, she was kind of talking it out with herself with Ezekiel where after they were like, yeah, your mom was a fighter and a survivor and that kind of thing. And she's like, well, all the people weren't bad. You know, Mrs. Travis wasn't bad. And Sammy and his people weren't bad. And, you know, she went through a whole bunch. And I was just like, oh, God, this poor girl. Like, she is just no wonder why she, like, went a little crazy and started dressing walkers up in diorama scenes around the city. Those were so great. I they were, and I I loved that they sort of played on that at the end with uh, the conductor and the ticket taker uh, hanging out with Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was my bad. It was kind of a very minimal bad, um, but I mean, just even to the point where she talks about, yeah, he really cracked me in the jaw, and she's like, I'll be okay. It's healed fine every time it's been fractured. So, I mean. Oh, that's just heart wrenching. <sighs> yeah. What was your bad? So my bad was a lot harsher than yours. I <laughs> just felt like the writing was really uneven. And I realized that a couple of the things, actually, all of the things that I wrote down for the writing was uneven are actually now that I look at them things that were because they weren't real. So maybe Mm -hmm. it seemed uneven because they weren't actually real. Mm -hmm. But the things that I wrote down, I thought Eugene's dialogue was completely stilted and awkward when he was talking to Princess through that grate. Mm -hmm. And not like stilted and awkward, Eugene awkward, but more like stilted and awkward, I don't believe this for Eugene. You know, and his voiceover in the beginning, and I know Steve and Diana have talked about not liking these voiceovers by the different characters. There was, this was almost, this didn't even sound like Josh. It sounded like somebody doing a Eugene impression reading in a studio where the volume was cranked too loud. Like it was just, it was very, very not eugenish but they were really trying to hard to be like it was very weird yeah i agree yeah. um the other thing that i wrote down was i thought ezekiel's dialogue especially when he jumped out of the ceiling and was like carrying on was bizarre but again mm-hmm. not real and then the guards dialogue his whole monologue while he was talking at like yeah no it was just weird but again was the guards monologue real or not I don't think it really was. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I when I first wrote all those things down for my bad, I was like, hmm, uneven writing. And now I'm like, eh, maybe they just didn't seem right because it was all in Princess's head. Yeah. So I liked on Talking Dead, the interview with the writer that they had on the show where she went on and was like, yeah, we almost actually didn't get to make this episode because people were really mad about... Ezekiel's character being off and like Paolo was re- like his princess is really off like nobody under and like we were like we couldn't let them in on the joke until the end you know because it's like telling a joke too many times it just it just loses something it falls flat and she's like we wanted them to be hit with that at the end and so they went through this whole thing and you know I think it was that she said that Angela King was like come on, this really is not making any sense at all, you know? And finally, when they hit everyone with it, it, you know, people were like, oh, perfect. You know, this, this all makes sense now. It's great. I love it. You know, so. Yeah, I'm still not in the, it all makes sense now. And I love it. I'm in the, it all makes sense, but I still didn't love it. Did you watch it once or twice? I watched it once. Okay, because even Kari Payton was like, this was one that I, he's like, I watched, and then I immediately went back and rewatched to see if I could pick things out that were, would be 
where odd would have been obvious if I'd have known the ending, you know, he kind of like the whole, I, I didn't pick up until my third watch that like, she's standing there like, no, I don't have any bites on my body. But Your I have this third watch. I, I watch certain parts a third time. Um, but she's like, the splinter in my finger is driving me crazy, you know? And then, of course, in Talking Dead, when they called back to when they all, when she first met all of them, and she's like, maybe you're not real. I haven't hallucinated before, but there's a first time for everything, you know? So she has now hallucinated all of them. So. Very interesting. This This whole episode, very interesting. Yeah. All right. Like I said, it it increased. It it was definitely not a four point one. It yeah. was in the low threes for me. I don't think I'm but. gonna watch it again. <laughs> I mean, there are tons of episodes that I will go back and watch, and we've talked about them before. The pilot, the Grove, Vato's internment. There are tons of episodes I will go back and rewatch. This is not one. Yeah. There are a lot of episodes from season ten that I'll go back and watch again. Morningstar was great. Stalker. Ghost. Yeah, ghost. Yeah. Totally. Um, but So you actually have already talked about my ugly in a funny kind of way. Um I love it when she comes back in and she's like, I'm not crazy. There's the ADHD, the anxiety, oh, the PTSD, that the was, depression. I the loved that one. Yeah. And the active imagination to deal with all that that helps me cope with all that a bit. But Maybe that's the only sane response in an insane world. And I'm like, yeah, like the uh, article after article after article after article on every news site that I subscribe to is like talking about how we just have um, uh, an mental and physical exhaustion we all have covid fatigue we have pandemic fatigue we have work from home fatigue um there are people it's finally hitting a white collar industry where um when polled i think 43 percent of financial analysts were talking about quitting their jobs because they can't handle the work from home element anymore um, people are missing their coworkers and their clients and the interaction with daily life. And, you know, so, you know, we, we all expected this to be over by now. I mean, a lot of us, a lot of people expected it to not be a thing, you know, for nearly this long. And every time there is a light at the end of the tunnel, we're, we're vaccinating at an amazing rate right now, but we still have to wear masks even after we're vaccinated. And we still, we still do need to socially distance. They have opened up vaccinations in a lot of places for 16 and over. And, um, but the vaccines just aren't readily, readily available yet. And there are people who aren't going to get them and people who can't get them. And so, you know, we all thought we were done with this six months ago. We all thought we were done with this three months ago. We all thought we were done with this currently. And now people are partying down in Florida. And, you know, Texas has relaxed its restrictions. And we're not done with this. And the more we open things up prematurely, like, the longer this is going to drag on. And... So I think that's why I identified with this episode a lot is there was just a lot of physical and mental fatigue, you know, that surrounds loneliness, depression, PTSD, anxiety, things like that. All of the things that a lot of people of people are going through a lot more of right now. So, um I, I haven't been a real big fan of other other than Daryl getting a girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> Agreed. I, of I this whole been, last portion of the season. Right. I yeah. haven't been a real big fan of it. Um, but, you know, they're doing this at the height of the pandemic. And so bravo for being able to pull off as much as they've pulled off. Um, yeah. 
I would like to comment because based on what you just said. So there were several things, and this is this is re- related to Thomas O'Mara's comments to me that I may or may not have relayed on recent podcasts. But he was like, you know, a lot of this was fi- this was filmed during COVID, and so I was watching this kind of with an eye toward. Oh, well, they were able to just have three people in the trailer set, the guard, Ezekiel and and princess, you know, Mm -hmm. they they were able to socially distance by doing this, that or the other thing by having princess and Eugene talk to each other through the grate. So, I mean, I was really watching it with an eye toward them actually filming with COVID in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and, and there was an interesting little shot when they were, it was, I think it was stills from behind the scenes where it was one of the uh, scenes where Princess was talking to Ezekiel and the two walkers that were on the other side of the fence. And in that particular scene, the two walkers were wearing surgical masks. And it was oh, almost like... Oh, I missed that. Uh, and it was just in the picture. It, of course, it wasn't on the screen. I, I don't think they CGI'd them out. I think that was going to be a shot where it was... Where they were focusing on Princess, but they had Ezekiel and the two walkers there, you know, because of realism. So they weren't actually in the shot at the time. But and be, because they weren't, they were wearing masks. And so I thought that was an interesting thing that they, those precautions that they took and then talking about how they did have some, the access to the um, rear road car itself, but then they also built a rear road car set. And they were able to distance much better. Yeah. And, you know, open it up and air it out and everything. So, um, yeah, I, I really, I really like what they have done with the limitations that they have had. Um, but I still would like to add nothing good ever happens in railway cars. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get eaten. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so what was your ugly? So my ugly, and you've already kind of talked about my ugly is that I really liked princess's backstory and the trauma history that they gave her. Mm -hmm. I thought Paolo Lazara just played it incredibly well. And you've already mentioned the two moments that really stuck in my head when she said that her mother said, just don't eat. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. And then when she talked about the repeated fractures of that one side of her jaw and how they'd healed just fine in the past. And she implied that they had healed several times. Yeah. That was heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So profoundly good. I just, you know, kudos to the actress for playing it so well and kudos to the series for doing that incredibly well. There was a lot that I did not like about this episode. I thought that the trauma history and the way that they wrote it and the way that they wrote her her distress in this episode was quite good. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my ugly and it was a good ugly. Good. Yeah. Um... Yeah, when she was uh, coping with her claustrophobia, when she was, and when she was counting her steps, I think she was measuring her space um, because of her basically claustrophobia, uh, dark, confined spaces. And then the uh, reciting of the state capitals in alphabetical order was when she, she was like basically having an anxiety attack. So. Um, I thought that was cool. Yeah, you know, very well, very well done. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say about the episode. Hmm. Now, Um, funny, I didn't love it as much as you did, but I might have more in my notes, so I need to look at my notes. Go ahead while I'm looking at my notes. (laughs) Well, that usually happens, because when I like an episode, I generally think it speaks for itself, and when I don't like an episode... You talk about it a lot. Yeah, I'm like, this is everything I did not like about this episode. So I will say that the little bit of cinematography at the very beginning, where they kind of, it's slow motion, it's frozen, and there are some effects, I really liked that. Hmm. 
<laughs> you're like, I don't remember. I watched it three times and I'm not sure what you're talking about. It's <laughs> right at the beginning. Like, as they're showing... I, I think it's probably footage from the end of the season that they reworked. Yeah. Yeah. And that was another one where I was like, okay, she has been thrown into this railway, dark railway car. You know, she's claustrophobic. She's been separated. And so she's having, is she, is this something she is misremembering because she was also hit? Because they showed Yumiko getting hit. And I'm like, maybe Princess was hit. And because she's sort of been playing all of these different parts she put Yumiko in her position in her head I did not know what was real and what wasn't going through all of this so I I was like I wasn't even sure that that went down the way it went down so yeah um so another thing that I have written down is I didn't feel like this episode really moved the overall story forward I have any of them? No, none of them have. Yeah. So far, no. none of them have. These are bottle episodes. And, you know, some of that may be, as Thomas pointed out, it's it's because of... Um, because of... Sorry, I'm blanking. Because of COVID. You know, they're yeah. bottle episodes because they have to have a small cast and COVID. Um, I am looking up. Uh, you're fading out, which is interesting because you haven't the whole time that we've been podcasting, but now our quality is not so good. So, well, biters, so we're sorry. We've had some struggles with Skype tonight. I am also using that really loud clickety keyboard. Yeah, I can hear that, but your your sound was still fading even with that. Oh, okay. Like it was fading <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe it's fading because of the Benadryl and the alcohol. No, it totally wasn't that either because <laughs> we would both be fading because I took ibuprofen and alcohol tonight. So I really needed some ibuprofen. I was very, very stiff today. Um, um, oh, so I was just looking up the uh, for the benefit of all those and those who seek solace at our gates. Yeah, so I don't remember that from the comic books. Was that a thing in the comic books? I was just looking that up. Well, you were looking that up, and this goes back to, like, not being comfortable with Eugene's dialogue, but when he was like, you know, basically like, I know Stephanie and her people are going to be okay, and they're just testing us. I was like, uh-uh, that's not Eugene. He wouldn't assume that. And then, you know, now again, I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense, considering that Eugene, yeah, no. This was all a fragment of Princess's imagination. Hmm. Okay, well, you're look- are you still looking it up? I am. So and one one more thing, and you had mentioned this earlier, the guard, like, strolling back and forth past Princess while she was naked. Yeah. And, like, I don't know if she had just come out of the shower. It looked like she had just come out of the shower. I was like, ugh. This so, is, like, kind of Holocaust-y. This is gross. Uh, there was a... Th- and maybe I'm making this up in my drug addled head. Um, but there was a scene that I think that was in uh, like a coming soon on the walking dead. And I don't know if it was like specifically coming soon on this episode or coming soon this season. Um, but I do remember a scene where they're like, they have her up in one of those showers and they are hosing her down. Like, Holocaust survivor style, you know, like delousing mm-hmm. her basically. Yeah, and ew. I kind of want to think that they cut that out recently, and for any number of reasons of what's going on in society now. I mean, you you could you could point finger have quite a few fingers at 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 anything that is going on. So, um, yeah. I I think there was a scene where she was because she mentioned that um, Ezekiel was wet, too. So he got hosed down at some point. But of course, he wasn't real. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, I I vividly remember. And again, maybe I have fractured off from that Mandela universe that 
you know, had that included. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing that quote specifically. Hmm. Oh, another thing that I wrote is that I don't remember the Commonwealth Guards being that brutal when I read the comic books. I mean, there was definitely some violence, but I don't remember them, like, greeting our survivors with that kind of violence. Yeah, and I get the whole, we're not going to take you to our place until we figure out who you are. And they do the questioning, but I don't. I don't see them like getting frustrated during an interrogation when she won't answer the questions and like practically breaking her jaw for it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not catching that specifically anywhere. So. Okay. Um, I might be close to the end of my notes. So what was the symbolism of the splinter coming out? Uh, the end of her fever dream. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, that's, it's, it was almost like a book ending when, when reality, I think, cause, but I, I want to think that she was already in it before she got the sliver um, because she was talking to Yumiko and I don't think she was actually talking to Yumiko when she got that slipper, sliver, but when she was taking the guy's cuffs off and she was like, all right, I'll answer all your questions, you know, um, I think that signified like the end of her delusion, her back to reality. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Oh, this, the end. So they haul her out and she sees Eugene, Yumiko, and Ezekiel, like, captive by the, by the guards. What? And so, are we, we're not going to get anything else about that. Not this season, no. No. I don't think so. Um, I honestly think that um, they sort of passed the test. And the bags are on the head so that they can take them to the Commonwealth, um, but not have them know the way, you know. Uh, so I, I think it it was meant to look menacing and nefarious, but I think it's all good. I think they're just going to be taken to the Commonwealth to see how the things are done and probably to p fill out some of that paperwork he was so proud of. The guard was like, we even have paperwork we have to fill out. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's a totally evil society. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had that, that image in my mind. That's so funny. That's a totally evil society. That's hilarious. Trust me. We live in an evil society and all I do is paperwork all day. <laughs> Nothing good comes from paperwork. You know, I mean, I, like, take care of people for a living and all I do is paperwork all day. It's ridiculous. It is. We should have robots doing this stupid work for us by now. Ugh. All right. Ugh. Anything else? No, that's actually all that I had. I don't think I have anything else either. I, it's like it's, a record short episode. It is. It's like an hour and 13 minutes, which is rare for us on Biters. It's rare for us on any of our podcasts these days. It is. It is 1022 at night. I still have to do yoga because my whole body is so sore. And <laughs> I still have to watch finding no framing Britney Spears. And I have to take yep. our mother to the doctor tomorrow. And life is just ugh. <laughs> Uh, and you've taken a sleeping pill and a Benadryl, so you're probably trashed. Yeah, I am. A Benadryl, sleeping pill, sleeping pill, and a um, sea donkey. <laughs> and 
I have another one sitting here unopened. Training her liver. Really tempted. <laughs> My liver don't need no training. <laughs> so I told Nick, our podcasting friend from Italy, he said something about um, having to imbibe a lot of substances to watch the Zack Snyder cut for of the, the movie for Capes and Lunatics. And I was like, huh, you sound like a guy after the hearts of all of the ladies on this podcast. <laughs> and he was like... I'm going to take that as a compliment. And I said, you better because you Lilith should. and Marnell are badasses and I'm catching up. <laughs> Quickly, may I add? <laughs> right. I'm working on it, sister. Too bad you get whiz quiz because it's legal in this state. You know, it's never been my jam. Mm. I like edibles. It's never been my jam. Yeah. I will say, and this is probably something I shouldn't confess, but I did, did try edibles once, not a super long time ago, and I had the most horrible trip ever. Horrible. <laughs> horrible. I was like, mm, never doing that again. Oh, you did the devil's lattice. You can't work for Biden now. I Ugh. actually I actually thought I was going to have a psychotic break. Oh my God. Yeah, it was bad. I thought I was not coming back from it. I actually just hate that whole slow time thing. Ugh. I, I have yet to find my strain because, like, I have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, I wake and bake and then I get in this groove and I clean my whole house. And I'm like, wait, are you sure that's not meth? <laughs> are you smoking meth? <laughs> you know, give me... I have yet to find the strain that makes me want to clean, clean my house. Right. No, I'm like, give me a vodka something any day and none of it makes me want to clean my house. <laughs> no. I did, however, install, the, well, with help, installed the chandelier in my home office this weekend. So I did get pictures of your home office. It looked pretty cool. You kind of sent them at not the best time in my life. But yeah, you were I did, busy. Yeah, I did get them and they were very cool. Yeah, my home office is turning into a very fun room to be in. All right. Well, <sighs> we're going to do this again tomorrow. Not about Walking Dead. No. So I should probably do some stretching and find my bed, and you should find your bed. You can do uh, yoga to uh, toxic. (laughs) You know, that is actually one of my favorite songs, although I have to admit, I like the Glee remake better than I like the the original. Okay, I liked the creepy one that was on A Promising Young Woman, the one that done by Violins. Yeah. And uh, Diane needs to post on The Real Housewives because I don't have access to our Facebook account. Why do you not have access to our Facebook account? I, you, have, you haven't given me the okay. stuff yet, apparently. Hold on. While you're you talking, to, I'm going to go there make right me a page now. Admin. But for those of you who have been wanting to see A Promising Young Woman and hopefully listen to our podcast, Promising Young Woman has gone down in price to watch. It is no longer $20 to watch. It is $6 on all of your streaming platforms. Uh, Voodoo, Hulu, Amazon, some other stuff, um, YouTube. Uh, so it has gone down to 6 bucks. It was worth it at $20. Uh, you could, it'll, the price will probably go down again. Probably not anytime too soon. I highly, highly highly recommend going and watching a promising young woman for six bucks and then listening to our podcast it was such a good movie i'm still raving about that movie in fact i just recommended recommended it to the the new fellow that i am spending some time with because it's such a great movie yeah okay i feel stupid but i am not sure how to fix our page (laughs) so either you're going to have to help me or okay. Rob's going to have to have to help me because I'm ridiculous. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, hmm. I just, I, I've been trying to keep an eye on it so that when the price did drop, we could spread the word. Because I know that there were a lot of people out there who were like, it looks amazing. It sounds amazing. But it's 20 freaking dollars. And now it's not. So I would just like everybody to go and watch that movie and support the movie because it's a really, really good movie. It's Even if you don't listen movie. to our podcast, which I recommend that you do because, yeah, I mean, if you're listening to this one, we're obviously hilarious. We're extra. Um, <laughs> 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 and now I'm all bougie with my chandelier in my office. You know. Uh, but, yeah. So I just wanted to throw that in real quick. 
Okay, there needs to be at least one admin on the page. Okay, I've kind of figured it out, but I'm not quite sure. Assign a new page role. <sighs> I'm doing all of the critically important stuff while we are still online. Right. Oh. It's 1030. We started late. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no. Part of it was me. We were having technical difficulties because I tried to change up what computer I logged into because we have like 500 of them in this house. And so I was like, no, nah, I'll use my own laptop in my own office. No, that didn't work. Okay. So should I make you a moderator or an administrator? Administrator. Oh, I'm ridiculous. Phenomenal cosmic power. Itty bitty living space. It doesn't give me a chance to let make you an administrator. It lets me make you an. Um, we won't do it online. Okay. I'll have to. I'll have to do some more. You'll have to see what see where it gets you with what I just did, and I'll okay. have to do some more. All right. So, yes, we. It's late. We started late, and now people are listening to me do admin stuff on. Yeah. Sorry. 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 It's sorry. While. It's been a while since we spooky shift the audience. <laughs> Oh, oh, that reminds me. So very quickly, um, Thomas O'Mara said, because I, I will feel bad if I don't get his info and Shenandoah Grand Puba Gore's info um, shared. So let me, let me look at their feedback. So Thomas said, whoa. 4.85 TDs out of 5. I don't know what TDs are. You might be able to figure out the initials after watching. TDs. Help me out here. Mm. Yeah. Nope. Mm. Nope. All right, Thomas, enlighten us. I'm feeling kind of dumb, but here we are. He said, I won't give my rating joke because of the spoiler. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah. We're both too far, too far into our cups at this point, apparently. All right, and then Shannon Doagran Pubag Gore said Dwayne Jones was the actor who played Ben in Romero's Night of the Living Dead. He is significant because he was the first black lead actor in a horror movie in 1968 and a black character who slapped a white woman in the face. The character of Ben was not written to be a black character necessarily. He did the best reading and was awarded the part. Fascinating stuff. So, so remember that- we talked about the whiskey. Yep. Yeah. But Dwayne yeah. Jones was also Morgan's son. Okay. So kind of a cool, like, call out to the original Dwayne Do- Jones and then kind of a call out, cool call out to Morgan's kid. Yeah. Yeah. Very All cool. right. Thank well, you for, for confirming that because I, I thought I saw that on Talking Dead, but I, I was not 100% positive. Yep. So anything else before we finally wrap it up? No, I think we are good for the All right. evening. Spooky chef. <laughs> <laughs> we have two more episodes left, and then we roll straight into Fear the Walking Dead. So mm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm kind of having a, a Zack Snyder cut moment. <laughs> I have a lot of life to get back, and that's not life that I want to lose. So here we are. <laughs> All right, everybody. Just remember, take Take it it one one dead dead day at a time. Have a good week, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Bye.